Hi, I'm very glad to be here. And if we want to decode Earth, we also have to ask the questions, how did it form? And how did it form along with our solar system? And if we ask this, we have to go further, because recently astronomers are discovering so many different exoplanetary systems. And how can this then be? How did they form? And this is all, of course, leading to one big question. What is necessary for the formation of an Earth-like planet where an evolution of life is possible? And where would we find it? So, if we want to find the answers for these questions, we have to look at the details and we have to go back to the origins. We have to go back to the origins of our solar system and investigate these very, these very early processes happening then, because these early processes were affecting a nearly initial system and therefore were most important for the whole later evolution of the system. So, I'm here as a member of the AXIS team from the um, Goethe University in Frankfurt. And we're students of Earth science and physics, and we're one of the three teams who could convince the DLR to have an experiment at the International Space Station. And that's cool because at the International Space Station we have zero gravity conditions, and these are exactly the conditions we need. Um, to investigate these very early solar system processes by experiment. And the AXIS experiment we're going to do is investigate a very early planet forming process. It's the process of the formation of the chondrules. And if you're now wondering what chondrules are, well, I would say let's have a look back, back to the very beginning of our solar system 4.56 billion years ago. And by then, the sun wasn't as big as it is today. It was just growing, and it was growing by material falling onto it along magnetic field lines of the sun. And this material was concentrated in a huge disk rotating around our young sun. And by the end of the sun growing process, 99.8% of the whole initial solar system matter would be consumed by this process. So only 0.2% would remain to later build all the planets, including Earth, of course, and every other solar system body we know and we have. And that's why this material disk is so interesting for Earth science, because every element we find here on Earth, and we would find on every other planet and every other solar system body, is actually present within this disk in its individual chemical con uh, concentration and abundance. And what we know about these disks is that the material there was mainly present in two states. Either it was hot gas, so you have to imagine that every element there was heated up so much that it was in its gaseous state. All the materials were dust particles. So the dust particles then would be the condensates from this hot gas. So you have to imagine that the hot gas at some cooler areas maybe, and especially in a certain distance from the young sun, would cool down, would condense and form solid chemical compounds, we call them minerals. And these minerals then were present as protoplanetary dust particles in dust grain sizes. So we have dust particles, we have hot gas. And what's we all, what we also already had was the formation of the first asteroid bodies. And this is also important because of two things. And the first thing is that these asteroid bodies later would evolve by collision with particles, by collision with other asteroid bodies, to the first planetoid bodies, which already had an inner metallic core and an outer liquid mantle. And these planetoid bodies later would evolve to the terrestrial planets, including Earth, of course. So these first asteroid bodies were our direct precursor material for Earth. And they are also important because they are our witnesses of these times. So we find pieces of them, we find fragments of them produced by asteroid-asteroid collisions as meteorites on our Earth. And that's really, really cool, because we can have a look inside of them, and we can see what objects are inside of them. And what we see is not only dust, 
know what we see, and what we see are round-shaped spherical objects, marble-like objects, and these objects sometimes make up more than 80% of the volume of these meteorites, so they were making up 80% of the Earth precursor material, so they are really important. But we do not know how they form. These, exact, these objects are the chondrules I was talking about. And since we know these meteorites for a long time, so scientists investigate these meteorites, actually these meteorites are named after chondrules, they are called chondrites, for more than 100 years now, um, we have at least some data. We have a lot of data, actually. And we have chemical data, and these chemical data suggests that our chondrules were somehow a chemically evolved product of our protoplanetary dust. So we take this as first fact, and then we can go further. We can have a closer look to our chondrules. We can go down to microscopic scale, use the polarized light microscope to distinguish between several mineral grains within these chondrules, and then we see by the alignment of these several grains that our chondrules weren't condensates from hot gas, but they were more crystallized products of a somehow molten material. So we, have, we can imagine them as crystallized molten droplets fl wearing floating around in zero gravity in this very beginning of our solar system. And now we take these two facts, chemically evolved products of our dust particles and molten crystallized droplets, and we can make an assumption about our process, which formed our chondrules, and must somehow have molten up our dust particles, from which later on these chondrules were then uh, crystallized. So this is also known for more than 50 years now, <laughs> but we don't know the formation process, but we have um, several theories. And for the access experiment, we have chosen um, the nebular lightning theory, which is um, actually telling, um, or which is actually saying that in this protoplanetary disk, somehow lightnings occurred. And these lightnings served as energy deliverance for heating up our dust particles, melting them, so we can produce our chondrules. And uh, with the exit experiment, we're not investigating how these lightnings occur, we're just saying or we just want to find out if these lightnings um, would be plausible to, to melt our dust particles. And if you then think of an experimental concept, it's rather simple. So you just need your dust particles with the same chemical composition and the same grain size, of course, and you need to generate lightnings, maybe via electric discharge. And you then have to observe your dust particles and the behavior of it during the lightning, during the heating, and after, and um, to find out if any chondrule-like objects would form. So, rather simple concept, but since it's at the ISS, um, there are some limits, and, oh, I forgot it. Just have to get it. So, we have a major limitation, and it's space. Actually, the whole experiment has to fit in the volume of this box. Um, the volume is roughly one and a half liter, and the measurements are 10 times 10 times um, 15 centimeters. Here you can see it. And uh, yes, if you now consider of the hardware you need for the experiment, um, then it's getting more complicated. So we um, made a first concept design for our experiment, and um, it looked like this, and we have um, a power supply in it. So we have a battery pack in it because we need the power for our lightnings to melt our dust particles. We, of course, need an electric circuit, an electric circuit and a high-voltage unit to produce our lightnings. We also need a sample chamber, the place where the actual experiment takes place, where our dust particles are floating around and where electrodes are embedded to produce our lightnings. And what we also, of course, need is an optics, because we want to film it, we want to, um, we want to watch the behavior, the motion of the particles and what happens during and after heating. So we also need optics with cameras 
and we need a mini computer because the whole experiment has to run fully automated for the whole experiment time of 30 days abroad the ISS and there will not be an astronaut pushing a button when lightning um, should occur. So it has to run fully automated and what we also need then is the software for this. So um, it's getting more complicated and actually we solved the space problem and I think we're good with it. Um, that's the prototype, the first, and it's filled up a little bit more now. And um, I, think, I think we're good with the space issue, so we shouldn't have problems with this anymore. Um, but what is always a work in progress is the software for this experiment. So every time you need to change a hardware piece because NASA has some new specifications we did not know earlier or um, because we want to have uh, more energy with our lightnings and use a bigger or um, one more capacitor for our um, high voltage circuit, then you also have to apply these changes to your software. So it's always a software which is um, work in progress and for our software we are very, very happy to have help from um, the hackerspace Frankfurt and some friends and they're doing this just because they are fun um, programming I guess and because they're interested in the experiment and without them this would not be possible without them the experiment could not run and that's that's really great thank you and what we're all waiting for is um, this day the day when this day oh Ah, this day, <laughs> the day when the Cygnus transport system is delivering our experiment to the ISS. So when then a few days later, oh, okay, it's appearing there. When then a few days later, um, our experiment can generate the first data for decoding the Earth's past. Thank you very much.